Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Melis Howard, and I'm a director at Archeo Architects. And I would say a particular thank for joining us because now that the pubs are open and the sun is shining, it's really kind of you to take your time to attend another Zoom event. But I really hope we'll make it worthwhile. Um, we're here for an hour and um, please do uh, leave your questions in the chat box. I'll be monitoring it and we have a chance for a Q&A at the end. So as I say, my name is Melis Howard. I'm director of Archeo Architects. And we are an architecture practice with a focus on community-led development and the future of housing. We're really interested in changing ways of living, we call it. And so we were invited by the London Society to curate a series of talks on this theme. So thank you also to the London Society for allowing us to have a number of um, talks and for setting all of this up. Um, last month, my co-director Kyle hosted a webinar on the topic of well-being and high density after COVID responding to the really intense relationship that we've all had with our homes over the last year and why we need well-designed dense cities and not overcrowded buildings. And for this evening's discussion, as we see lockdown ending, hopefully for the final time, we are metaphorically moving out of our home and into our environs and considering what has perhaps changed and how our relationships with our neighborhoods has a newfound hyperlocality. Uh, there's a, a, just a small quote from the Mayor of London's Recovery Roundtable report under the heading of Embrace the Local, and it said that an estimated 40% of jobs can be done from home, reshaping the daily pattern of the city, and there's an opportunity here to use the built environment to stitch together new networks of work, care and leisure centred on the neighbourhood. So, I mean, clearly with more people working from their local neighbourhood and communities perhaps more cohesive and perhaps more connected, um, since the beginning of COVID, we wanted to ask this evening about how this new hyperlocality enforced by COVID might help um, build a resilience in local neighbourhoods and how a grassroots and a community led um, way of doing things might play a part in the recovery from this last year. There's some very broad themes there and the conversation can go in many directions, but um, I'm really delighted that we have this evening three speakers who each bring a really different perspective on this question and these themes. Um, what I'm going to do is introduce everybody and then each of our speakers will do a short presentation, we'll come together for a bit of a discussion and then I'm really keen to, to spend some time on the Q&A from the audience. So uh, I'll introduce everybody. First up we've got Christina Montero, Director of DKCM. She is going to um, introduce their GLA report on expanding the public realm. Um, Christina is an architect with a particular expertise in heritage and conservation. She's a researcher and a founding director of DKCM. In 2021, so this year, Christina was shortlisted for the Maura Gemmel Prize in recognition of, in of excellence in design for women designers under 45. Um, her work explores the complex history and ecology of a place, and she is a champion of equitable access to nature and is currently developing a campaign to make cities wilder, more biodiverse places. Um, after Christina, um, Vlad Bedogan is a designer and a strategist working in the regeneration team of Architecture Zero Zero. He is working on a spectrum of projects ranging from non-residential space strategies to operational, financial and building management models for community, civic and workspaces. And today he's going to be presenting some of the ideas that emerged from their recently published pamphlet, Flexible Workspaces on Our High Streets. So if perhaps Christina and Vlad are bringing a kind of more research and um, policy based angle, I think William is bringing a, perhaps the more grassroots angle to this evening's talk. Um, William um, Chamberlain is the founding director of Creative WIC and the founder and chairman of the Cultural Interest Group, a local business to business innovation network established in 2010. He's co-founder of the Hackney Wick and Fish Island Community Development Trust, set up to engage local stakeholders to secure ownership of buildings and spaces in community interest. He has a longer and very impressive CV, but I think that's enough for now. Um, and he's going to be talking about the living lab research they've been doing in Hackney Wick. So I'm going to mute myself and hand over to Christina to start us off. Thank you, Christina. <clears throat> I'm unmuting myself and I'm going to try and share my screen. It worked a little while ago, so um, so.
So, oh, so yes, um, thank you, Melis, for inviting me today. Um, and I had a sort of uh, a page for introducing the practice and to say what we do. But I think I've, I, I've been uh, very well introduced by Melis, so I might save um, some time here. But yeah, I, I'm to, to in a very nutshell, I, I, I'm a, a kind of liberal arts designer with a, a, a special interest in conservation and that in interest in conservation is in two uh, um, realms, the kind of environmental realm and uh, heritage, <laughs> which don't all often kind of are, are combined, but, uh, but, but yes, that's who I am. And, and uh, DKCM, we, we, we are uh, architects, researchers, authors and strategies working really in the public uh, 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 sector, um, um, in the public realm, to, um, um, yeah, and, and today I wanted to sort of tell a positive story. <laughs> um, I think there is a real glimmer of hope uh, in the way that um, COVID-19 restrictions uh, have made us adjust to a more local life. I think uh, uh, Mel has described it really well. And I think there, the, it, it's bringing a, a very positive impact to uh, uh, both socially and economically uh, to our uh, local communities. Um, uh, and, and I dare say that that could be potentially a, a sort of renaissance um, um, in terms of local economies and resources. <clears throat> um, despite the, the current threat presented to our local high streets, both in terms of planning and in terms of the, the kind of, no one really knows how many businesses are going to be open um, post lockdown three. <clears throat> we, um, we know that, um, that um, our, our local high streets um, should be places where we, we have um, independence businesses um, and that kind of represent the communities um, um, uh, connect, connected to them, in them. But we also know that <clears throat> that the hyper local is something that um, that uh, that has uh, an enormous uh, uh, um, capital value, um, and big brands that were built on on um, on known local on uh, on global uh, uh, resources and economies um, um, have always uh, and will remain to adjust to, 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 lo to the convenience of the locality. And uh, in this slide, which is uh, not a very pleasant look, it, it's uh, seeing Amazon fresh coming into the high street, you know, so, um, so that there is a kind of a real evidence and proof that high streets are, um, are convenient. And, um, and but, but also we need to be the physical needs to embrace the online resources, um, and um, and and the and in order to support innovation and localness and and um, and distinct uh, entrepreneurship, one needs to embrace the digital and online resources. And at DKCM, we started doing this this thing, which we called um, call um, local so circular economy resource maps. Um, and um, we have now done a kind of um, resource maps for I think five different lo local authorities. And it's something that we want to grow um, and uh, we, we want to sort of make um, a kind of resource. And, and this really was brought by, by the, the guidance that, um, that um, Melis described uh, uh, that we uh, have been um, working on uh, or, or, or uh, the, during lockdown and uh, completed um, at the end of last year. Um, so the, the process of uh, writing de design guidance for the GLA um, and, and, and researching um, uh, was, um, was a real journey. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I, and I think we, we, we have taken many lessons from this journey and I wanted to show you more the lessons that we've learned and the things that we sort of um, uh, learned by uh, almost by accident uh, rather than uh, giving you a potted guide to the, to the research itself. Mm -hmm. um, so we understand that 
accessing connectedness uh, was uh, as much of giving awareness to, 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 to these types of spaces as well as um, physical, as well as digital. And we learned that there is an enormous amount of public spaces and rooms and enormous diversity of types. And they come in different shapes and sizes. Our city is made of public civic spaces. And really making room for this sort of just the positions and connections is really important when we're thinking about how do we design uh, the future of, of our um, high streets and our, our, our communities and neighborhoods. Um, and for instance, this image um, is um, for me really captivating because it's, um, it's the way that shows um, that there is opportunity for incident and innovation with with and 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 uh, in in um, in places that are um, busy um, and for instance in here you can see a kind of marsh that is a uh, uh, wetland um, uh, and but in suds but it's also an incidental play moment and I enjoy we enjoy very much the kind of uh, the layering of and the richness that that comes with layering of of, of purposes in the city. Um, we also understand that it's really important to make room for, um, for different types of civic uh, buildings and to promote uh, places for, um, for experiment. Um, and also making sure that, um, that our city is connected in, 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 um, through materiality, so bringing materials that would be associated with with the ordinary pavement into a kind of uh, private civic space um, could make our city more connected to which is something uh, that we were interested in and also um, spaces that are designed for movement should be really thinking about um, how you stop um, so movement and uh, and places for resting should really be uh, be, be considered together. And then lastly, I wanted to talk about how important it is for operators and businesses to, to play a role in shaping public realm. And that is about giving um, uh, businesses um, and, um, and um, enterprises uh, room to kind of um, adopt bits of city um, and, and make um, Make our neighbourhoods uh, more um, more complex, <clears throat> and I just wanted to sort of say that the, that there is a real demand for this type of space. Uh, we have recently completed um, um, a, a, a set of buildings that that um, for for uh, for a, a cultural uh, uh, art space um, in in um, in Harrow, um, which which has really proven that there is a real demand for, for um, public accessible uh, community rooms uh, and learning spaces. Um, and also um, there is a real uh, power on ephemeral buildings and designing buildings uh, that can sort of reinvent and uh, reframe the way that citizens think about their neighborhoods. And this is a, a temporary building called the Lighthouse um, that um, DKCM with the decorators uh, worked on a few years back now um, to um, to sort of reconnect um, Irith with um, with its um, uh, river in um, uh, um, sites and also to to sort of bring um, um, some bottom up ideas uh, of how um, the community plans its future. And that's me. I now need to stop sharing. Which... Thank you so much, Christina. I, I know I said I wouldn't interject between speakers, but just while Vlad shares his screen, I think it's really interesting how you kind of um, were summing up about uh, the opportunity for operators and businesses to shape their public realm. And it kind of moves on really nicely, I would say, to what Vlad's going to talk about in terms mm -hmm. of um, the themes of their report. So over to you, Vlad. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And um, again, uh, thank you, Melis, for the invitation to be part of the panel. Uh, so uh, 
thank Christina also for the presentation. It was great. And I picked on some points, which uh, I think you said that uh, the need to give businesses and enterprises the space. And uh, I think this was in a way our um, the starting point um, of our report. Um, so uh, I'm part of Architecture 00. We are um, a diverse practice under the umbrella 00. Uh, there are architects, but also economists, sociologists, researchers, uh, and we generally work in anything related to public realm, uh, to uh, the built environment from public realm to uh, operational models for buildings and so on. Um, so um, uh, the, the, the way uh, this pamphlet came about, we were asked by the GLA to um, look at um, the possibility of flexible workspace to be brought on uh, the high street. And our research involved conversations with a broad range of stakeholders, particularly with um, those who hold the keys, uh, because it became apparent from very early on that there are so many uh, great organizations and many businesses who would be able to have a great local impact. But the issue is always, how do you get your hand on the keys? Um, so, uh, uh, in the presentation, I would like to mostly touch on two things. One is how this infrastructure required by hyperlocalism uh, can be brought forward. And then secondly, how this can positively impact uh, and strengthen uh, our uh, high street resilience. So, um, uh, yeah, we have uh, mostly been um, commissioned to uh, bring forward uh, propositional guidance. Uh, uh, which comes in light with the changes in economies for the retail sector, then uh, of course the impact of COVID alongside shifting patterns and how we and uh, where people choose to work. Um, so uh, if we, we look at what is happening now, um, the high streets and generally our town centers have seen a, um, um, a growth in uh, vacancy, but uh, there are also uh, other options such as uh, big closures of anchor units, which uh, in a way make many of these high streets um, un unhealthy um, with long term vacancies and uh, so on. Um, so what we try to look is how elements such as uh, partnerships between stakeholders, uh, the curation of high streets, so on, can uh, both positively impact uh, all those. Um, involved in it, uh, be it from landlords to uh, agents, local authorities, and of course, uh, community groups and local organizations on the ground. Uh, and the main way we thought uh, that could be brought forward is by, uh, by high streets having local relevance and the use of them responding to local needs. So uh, we looked at four scenarios. Uh, I will mostly go into one, but just to mention all of them. Um, so one of them was public sector assets. So uh, let's imagine a former council office block uh, from the 60s, which is awaiting redevelopment. Uh, the timelines for this are usually 10 years plus. So what can you do in the meantime to also test uh, what those local requirements might be? Second one would be uh, shopping centers. And here we were particularly interested in how existing infrastructure uh, and we looked uh, here at food production, so the kitchen food court units in shopping centers, um, which are disused or uh, poorly used now could actually uh, become uh, test beds for uh, food production startups. Um, then also looking in the CAS in the uh, central London area to um, retail and hospitality and uh, how uh, this, uh, these can broaden, uh, broaden their offer uh, not to uh, remain attractive. And then the last scenario we looked at and the one I will focus on now is um, your um, average high street uh, with high vi uh, vacancy rates and what can be done in that. So um, all scenarios we present in the report are um, speculative, but at the same time, binded by real conditions, which I think we perhaps see uh, throughout London. Here with a particular focus on outer London, uh, also because with the decentralization of workspace uh, and uh, with the growth in hyperlocalism, 
I think Outer London will start to play a big factor in um, these changes of how we work. So um, here we uh, are, say, imagining a local high street in an Outer London borough with a high uh, vacancy, but a close proximity to transport links and relatively fragmented ownership. The units have historically been uh, hard to let. Uh, ex they experience long-term vacancy. And uh, yeah, these conditions um, are common in many high streets. And uh, we believe they have been caused by a paradox in the way high streets are managed. On one hand, uh, it is accepted and a lot acknowledged by both landlords and agents uh, and all involved stakeholders that a diverse uh, high street, which responds to local needs, will inherently be successful and benefit all those involved, uh, ranging from the other businesses existing on the high streets to, again, uh, the local community and uh, those who hold the, uh, the assets. On the other hand, many such uses, which would be beneficial and increase the footfall and the health of these high streets might not be profitable enough or might not afford the rent. So then the, there is this paradox where on one hand, um, it, it would be great to have these uses, but on the other hand, no individual landlord would say, sure, have my unit for a 50% discounted rent while uh, the landlord next to me will get full market rent. So um, what we propose here is the creation of high street trusts, where if uh, through conversation and partnerships between local authorities and landlords and communities on the groups, these assets are pulled together, both the uh, private sector and public sector assets are, are pulled together in a trust and curated in such a way that it responds to those local needs, then you will ensure a resilient and uh, healthy high street, while at the same time, um, um, so yeah, um, on one hand, you are de-risking the assets, and uh, the other, uh, on the other hand, you are also ensuring a sustainable and a resilient return. So um, we have been um, looking at a high level how uh, this high street trust um, mechanism could be put in place. So as we said, it's by beginning, uh, by establishing landlord forums, because it is a long way. Uh, currently, local authorities even have the issues where they don't fully know who owns their high streets. Um, so, beginning by uh, establishing these landlord forums, establishing trust, and then partnering with uh, workspace operators and businesses to manage this vehicle. And then uh, the way the vehicle works and how units are curated, how can uh, the local community on the ground be a form a big part of that? And what this would mean is that you work as a portfolio of units and then no unit will be adding less or more, but they are together. So the health of one unit and the um, impacts all the others. So um, again, as um, I said, this is a long process. So it, uh, not, not something that can be done overnight, but uh, what are some practical steps which can be uh, taken forward um, well, straight away uh, could begin from uh, starting to think about this portfolio approach to asset management. And this can be particularly significant for uh, areas which might see um, bigger landlords. So we are not speaking about um, small landlords who might own one shop or two, but uh, there are areas of, um, yeah, how uh, that can be started in those areas followed by practical templates for new contractual agreements. Uh, there is a, a growth in uh, service level agreements for uh, different uh, units if they have a certain social return, but how can we give these practical templates to community groups on the ground to have these tools to uh, negotiate and work together with the other uh, involved stakeholders to bring uh, these uh, things forward. And then of course, this forum for relationship building with landlords, which we see as a first step towards the creation of a high street trust. Um, and then, uh, yeah, as well as shared platforms and more the, the need for more uh, data um, uh, regarding the health of high streets to be more uh, publicly shared. So um, thank you very much. Um, I will now mute myself. And thank you so much, Vlad.
I'm going to try and also describe while William starts to share his screen, the kind of link that I see between what you've spoken about and perhaps William will is it this sense of um, spaces being used as test beds. It's been kind of a concurrent theme. And I think William's living lab research is going to sort of describe maybe a live test bed and understanding of what's going on in a really local situation. So hopefully that's a smooth link and has given you time, William, to share. <laughs> and I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Menace. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to participate tonight. Um, two fantastic presentations. I'm really enjoying the, uh, the local circular economy resource map from Christine. And I think Vlad's first slide gave a really good overview of um, what we did in, in Hackney Wick and Fish Island back in 2010. And on, on the map on, on Vlad's first slide, you would have seen rehearsal space, printers and framers, artist studios, recording studios, maker spaces. And when I came to Hackney Wick uh, in 2008, I found one of the world's densest artist creative communities. Um, it, it made me wonder how can, how can, with what is about to happen with the Olympic Games, how can an artist community, a grassroots creative economy like Hackney Wick and Fish Island survive? Uh, and really I've been thinking about that ever since um, I set up the Hackney Wick and Fish Island Cultural Interest Group as a business to business network in 2010. Um, and really it was an opportunity for people to come together and, and, and just meet um, to, 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 to share um, information, resources, uh, gossip, but, uh, but networks. And um, over the years it's grown, it's got about 2000 members now and we meet every month. Uh, generally have about 50 people in meetings and a wide range of, of, uh, of members, local stakeholders, uh, elected council officials, uh, councillors, um, council officers, developers, um, sole traders, uh, artists, creatives, residents. And it's, uh, it's been really interesting. And so we've set up a lab because what we have in Hackneywick is one of the last, largest grassroots creative economies in the world. And I'm just going to have to try and move this bar because I can't read it on top of my text. Um, so we've got this, this grassroots artist community. We've got this high, we've got a very high concentration of uh, social enterprise, non-profit and third sector businesses. We think there's about 30% membership made up of, of the third sector in the cultural interest group, which is incredibly high. Uh, and Hackneywick has this industrial heritage of enterprise and creativity. It's where uh, petrol was invented which is causing massive problems for the developers now who are, who are digging up uh, the sites where chemicals were, uh, failed experiments were practically just tipped into the ground and buried. So all that's coming back out again. Um, and an, an aging industrial infrastructure, uh, a disadvantaged residential community, and um, obviously the pandemic has impacted massively, particularly in the creative economy. Um, these new residents coming into the area, the new developments. Uh, this is the Fish Island Village, which is a Peabody development. And we're very fortunate actually in, in Hackneywick and Fish Island to have Peabody and, and other uh, housing association developers like Place of People and L&Q, uh, who have been very, very willing to engage with the existing creative economy. And it's proved to be a really good uh, source of revenue for lots of creatives actually who've been employed and commissioned by developers uh, as part of these schemes which is great and we've also got East Bank that's coming inside the Olympic Park with these amazing world-class cultural creative and educational institutions um, but as has been pointed out by the uh, by the street artists in Hackneywick that uh, not all re regeneration is seen as positive and um, there's a sense that despite all the efforts that actually the grassroots creative economy is being displaced by the development. And so what we have is this, this existing creative economy and actually this, the hyper-local is, is so important because what, what, what there is that exists in the creative economy because of the, the, the precarious nature of the creative economy you find that there's far more willingness to collaborate and share. And it's a, it's a really effective model for, for a hyper-local community. So 
we've been bringing people together, as I say, since 2010 to, to, to foster those personal relationships, those, those, um, um, those relationships that, could, that, that, that really do help build this social cohesion that is both so important and has been seen throughout the pandemic. Um, so we've got a lot of projects with the Living Lab. Obviously, we feel that we're a little bit on borrowed time, and, and so we've got to try and capture the data in these live settings whilst this grassroots creative economy is still there. And we have got creative enterprise zone status, one of the first creative enterprise zones um, have been since 2018. And so we're, we're hopeful. We've set up a community development trust as well, uh, going back to Vlad's presentation uh, very much along the same lines uh, we have a community development trust we're working with the local authorities the legacy corporation to identify assets we've actually got a, a, a big mapping an asset mapping commission out at the moment to find out exactly what there is in our neighborhood and who owns it and any opportunities there may be for the community development trust to to take ownership and become guardians of land and space for the benefit of the community. Uh, but we started our first research project in collaboration with Loughborough University London. And it was the, uh, the, the COVID-19 response and impact in the creative economy. And so we, we, um, we worked very closely with Loughborough University London and um, Innovate UK. Uh, the project was funded by the National Lottery Communities Fund and or rather our involvement in the wider Loughborough University project was funded by the National Lottery Communities Fund. Uh, and we've got lots of other ideas for research projects that you can see there. But um, the one that we've just completed and uh, we've published, it's on the Creative Wick blog, um, and I'll put a, 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 um, a link to it in the, in the chat list a bit later, um, is, the impact of COVID-19 on the creative economy in Hackney Wick, Fish Island and the wider Olympic Park area. And one of the key things on top of not surprisingly, you, you won't uh, be surprised to, to hear that the visual artists and performance artists have, have obviously had, they've been impacted most by the pandemic. Um, but what we've seen is the, 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 the networking and the resilience of the local creative economy as they've supported each other. And the, 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 the research results have, um, have demonstrated, I suppose, we, I, I, I refer to it as inside out regeneration and that's, that's I suppose, identifying the community anchors, the community assets, and, and helping them to become strong enough to, 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 to survive the process of regeneration. Um, in the, the cultural interest group code of conduct that, that we have for members, we, we encourage uh, sourcing, so, uh, sourcing local supply chain wherever possible. And um, with the massive developments that are happening, uh, in the area and particularly in, in, uh, in initiatives like Here East with university partners moving in, uh, Love University, um, UCL, um, Sports Interactive. These, these big, big organizations with massive purchasing potential have the possibility of, of creating a, a massive impact if we can encourage them to support, to, to source their, their local supply chain as much as possible and of course, as I mentioned earlier, working with the development sector, the development sector recognised that Hackney Wick and Fish Island has a lot of value in terms of its creative cachet, uh, certainly when it comes to selling, um, uh, selling apartments. Um, but there is this opportunity of, of, of sourcing local supply chain and particularly creative supply chain to build resilience and economic resilience in the creative economy. And, and as I say, I, I really feel as though it's a model that can be applied, not just in, uh, in Hackney Wick and Fish Island, but other places. So with that, I think I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you 
so much, William. Um, maybe if you unshare your screen, you can all chat. Um, I think uh, you often pull together these panels and then you and then I'm so delighted to see so much crossover and shared interest. I think um, what Will described, and if you read his report, we need each other more than ever, is a very, um, it's a kind of very delicate moment for the creative industries in Hackney Wick coming out of lockdown and, uh, you know, with so many big players able to influence the kind of future of the area. Um, so really worth reading. I might add a link to that report myself later. I think because we've already had a couple of really um, excellent questions from the audience, I might just move straight to them because they, they're basically the same things I wanted to know. Um, so Claire Richards, the brilliant Claire Richards has asked, um, Christina, Vlad and William all talk about addressing local need. What process do they propose to understand what is already there and to identify local needs and also valuable local knowledge? And if I could perhaps, I don't know if the answer, Christina, is your local circular economy resource maps, but I think everyone is extremely intrigued to what's in that and um, what your, perhaps whether that is about identifying local need and what's already there. Do you mind if I ask yeah, that double-handed question? To, I'm happy to respond. I think, um, well, I, I almost forgotten that um, um, 12 years ago, when I was a fresh part two um, uh, working at um, wonderful um, uh, MUF Architecture Art, um, I was one of um, of three people mapping Hackney Week <laughs> <laughs> and uh, basically putting on a map um, a lot of those, um, uh, you know, um, uh, creative industry uh, um, uh, enterprises and artist studios. And we really were trying to understand, um, um, MF was really trying to understand uh, uh, what was there. Um, mm. Because at that point, that mapping had not been done. And um, at the time, um, the plan was to make uh, uh, Hackney Week, uh, uh, a, a creative uh, a cluster. Mm -hmm. And uh, Liza Fuhr <laughs> rightly said, it's already the mm -hmm. densest creative cluster in Europe, yeah. if not the world. And, and sure enough, um, uh, I was one of uh, the people that, uh, that went door to door and some artists were less comfortable about um, Giving their names, uh, but together uh, with 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 local businesses, um, and I think now there is a real um, beautiful uh, uh, kind of interactive map of, of what what um, what is the creative culture um, in Hackney Week, um, and I think um, that study um, has um, certainly uh, empowered a lot of um, in, uh, social enterprises and. Um, and to be honest, until I heard William um, talk about it, I almost had forgotten <laughs> about <laughs> that, uh, that uh, journey that I'd gone through a long time ago. But yes, I think the, the local resource map came really from uh, the, um, the reading donut economics um, and thinking, what, what is there that I can, um, that my practice can do um, mm -hmm. with our resources and skills that we could do in order to turn, so Donut Economics talk, talks on a kind of general scale um, about creative uh, commons. Um, and I, I think our neighborhoods are our creative commons. Mm -hmm. So um, we've always, again, with our projects, tried to source things locally, try and use local um, skills, um, try and use uh, local workshops. And I think perhaps, something I learned from MUF and from mapping Acne Week, understanding that things can be done locally and can be more sustainable. Uh, sustainable. And you sort of go on this journey. And, 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 and I think we're, 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 I'll, 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 I'll let um, the others speak, but we, we really like to make um, these sort of data accessible um, uh, digitally, such that these resorts, such that you can also promote um, new talent and in it and, and, and new enterprises um, because there may be um, businesses um, or you know young startup I mean like, like the story of kind of the 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 way that um, Deliveroo has unlocked some 
kitchens that people that didn't exist, um, you know, that maybe not as as sort of um, um, you know as um, in 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 the in the in the sort of way that other uh, uh, um, kind of online kitchens and sort of uh, res resources have done. But I think there is a lot of opportunity to connecting places locally through online means. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and making a kind of public-facing um, uh, infrastructure, um, and that's something that that I sort of feel very strongly that we should think about public space in, in online um, mm -hmm. because online spaces tend to be private, and I think that we we need to start um, champion uh, resources that are. Uh, public um, and public facing because mm -hmm. currently the way that our governments and local governments speak to the public online it's very uh, inaccessible um, mm -hmm. so I think there is a kind of gap there but anyway I'll, I'll, um, I'll let others uh, respond the, to the question. Vlad? So, um, yeah if I um, no, I think uh, Christina touched very well on um, uh, methodology um, at the beginning and I think um, it's maybe also a question of who uh, understands this local need and uh, what is their background. And uh, the way she mentioned Muff, who I, I, I believe are pioneering these alternative uh, methodologies, which are borrowed from art and so on, in uh, recording what exists on the uh, ground, it is maybe different from uh, your traditional uh, architecture practice, which will look on Google and on the business inquiries list. And maybe this idea of being present and on the ground, speaking to local people who have their local knowledge and that understanding you will never get. Uh, but uh, those there are people who already have it. What is the involvement in that maybe mapping process? How can it involve the local people already existing on the ground? And I'm thinking now, and this has existed for a long time, like even thinking about the 70s, 80s, the um, community photography uh, classes, which would give children uh, disposal cameras, to take photographs of their favorite things in the neighborhoods and so on. How can this be, maybe this methodology, how can we be more creative about the methodology used in uh, uncovering what uh, exists on the ground? Um, yeah, that's pretty nice. I, I think there's always room to be creative about how you answer these questions. So it's really nice to introduce that. Um, I think, William, unless you had something to add, I'm going to move to the... Well, I was just going to say very quickly, because uh, what we've done is set up a newspaper. I, well, I think I recognise that the Culture Interest Group is only as, is only as comprehensive as its, as its members allow it to be. And so we rely on everyone to, to invite their own networks to join. And it's not uh, as efficient as it could be. Um, and a mapping exercise, the MUFF exercise, obviously, was the, was the benchmark that, that created the profile for Hackney Wick and Fish Island that we've been using ever since to... to to, to highlight this but we've set up a local new newspaper a hyper local newspaper called the wick um it has public editorial meetings so that people can come in and they can they can mm -hmm. uh, they can uh, suggest topics to cover in the newspaper and it's a great way of bringing people together and sharing information and, and helping people feel as though they're, 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 there are others their allies in the community I love that, William, because, you know, I get the Hackney paper through the door and I feel like the message is very bland. And what I really want is a kind of WhatsApp group that's a bit wider than my street. You know, I want to know what's going on. Um, and I think that I suppose, you know, the kind of street WhatsApp group was one of the reasons I wanted to do this talk, because it's just extraordinary. The level of communication at an extremely hyper local level. And so your newspaper is a really, really fantastic example of broadening that out a bit further. Right, and we've had so many good questions, so I'm just gonna stick with the questions, but make them slightly my own. I think one of the things we've talked about um, that you've all talked about, and I touched on this earlier, is how um, a kind of grassroots occupation of high streets and other local areas often relies on a bit of a kind of test bed situation. Um, maybe like we've had, you know, uh, meanwhile uses and um, et cetera. And I suppose even in the last year, there's been a really a resurgent in a sort of maybe an openness to things being tested quickly. I mean, your report in itself is called Living Lab and people talk about, um, there's been a lot of like high street widening that's just happened overnight, but it's very responsive and it's a really interesting moment. But my question, which I'm gonna link to someone else's question is that, how do we sustain this um, kind of test bed uh, openness? How do these interesting grassroots um, happenings 
get retained and don't just like say advertise how interesting and trendy the place is you know William you talk a lot about that in your work about how to how, how retention of these quality local things so my question is sorry I'm going around the houses everyone's really interested in how the high street trust might work in practice Vlad as perhaps an answer to this retention um, I know when we were emailing before this I was like please talk about high street trust I'm really curious so Paul and Fiona ask that and want to know how it would get around the problem of landlords wanting market rents. And Mel Wright asks whether it's been established anywhere else. So sorry for the long um, discussion that then ended up in a question, but if you could expand on the High Street Trust, that would be great. Sure. So uh, maybe I will um, start by um, responding to Mel's uh, question. Uh, on my understanding, there is no current uh, no current uh, high street trust in the form that we are imagining it but uh, i would like to draw those, some parallels between the high street trust and beats business, uh, business improvement district mm -hmm. and uh, also highlight that um, there are in a way two types uh, in um, the states um, business improvement district are usually based on partnerships between landlords uh, in the UK and England, uh, uh, they are based on uh, the relationship between bit occupiers uh, mm -hmm. of, of the shop, which then, of course, creates different dynamics and uh, opens up different windows of opportunity in um, uh, how, um, yeah, how you, you can bring uh, things forward. So I would say that while it does not exist, it maybe exists at a almost closer form uh, in, um, uh, in the States uh, because of this. And having i think that round table where you have landlords sitting around the same uh, table and discussing how this strip of street can be uh, done better uh, is very important and maybe this will then take me to try and answer the other question which is getting around uh, the problem of landlords wanting market rents i think uh, our proposal comes mostly in the context of hard to let units and landlords which get desperate they will have had a unit which has not been occupied in the past mm. two years uh, and so has have three other landlords on their streets they come together sit around a table and uh, then maybe there are also some some landlords which will have their units occupied but uh, the uh, businesses come and go and there is no uh, sustainability by having these stakeholders sit around the table and uh, in a way, be prompted by ideas such as uh, uh, coming together and having a curated approach, then the idea, what we are proposing is that these assets are collected. And then once say, okay, my space can be used for a community room, which will bring forward and therefore your tenant, which is a cafe and pays full market rent will have an increase in customers. Uh, but this, um, so you will have a resilient uh, occupa occupant. I will bring this more socially focused thing, but per, as per total, we are doing better than we were without it. So this is the way we are imagining it. Um, yeah, that's... I feel like Christina wanted to add to that maybe. I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about financing um, high streets. Um, and I think, um, you know, um, the idea of high street trust, I completely adore um, and I think we should to really push for that, but I think we also should push for um, um, for fight for for kind of individual ownership of um, of of high street buildings. So we have um, a lot of um, building stock facing high streets or creating our high streets um, that have um, that are in sort of um, you know in um, in um, in ownership in, in sort of in ownership of landlords and private ownership, but um, that uh, quite often one landlord owns a whole parade. Um, and and, um, and actually, um, um, high street buildings um, have um, been um, sort of, they, they have been designed to, to you know, the traditional uh, high street building, the shop is there and then the 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 shop owner uh, leaves upstairs they, they 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 were they had a kind of grain of in, in habitation that was very hyper local and uh, really about uh, leave work mm -hmm. and i know this from personal experience where i tried to buy um, a high street building and unfortunately i just couldn't unless i had the full capital um 
um, which we I didn't. I wasn't able to 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 have a mortgage uh, that would allow me to have a mixed use um, high street building. And some some banks even said we don't lend um, uh, for uh, houses with shops in front of shops or next to shops. Uh -huh. So that was uh, that was quite a, an interesting finding that 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 we had. And I think you know. Obviously, these government probably is not going to fund um, a kind of uh, a kind of high street bank, but I wonder whether whether there isn't a, a also a, a place to sort of um, to, to 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 sort of champion um, 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 uh, financing um, um, ownership uh, um, or, of uh, individual ownership of high street buildings as, as sort of an alternative mm -hmm. to to the kind of compulsory uh, mass redevelopment of, mm -hmm. of high street uh, buildings. Which, and by having kind of uh, independent uh, ownership and independent businesses, I think that innovation that we talk about will be embedded because um, humans are diverse by nature. Um, I, yeah, that's that was my my um, my response in relation to that. So, William, can, yes, just just very quickly, um, Hackneywick has. It, hasn't really got a high street yet but it's being it's coming it's, it, mm. it's coming um, um our community development trust is is hopefully going to be playing a very active role in that and i think the the essential elements you need for a genuinely mixed use community neighborhood uh is affordability and security of tenure and mm -hmm. if the in the hackneywick central master plan area affordability has been uh, pres uh protected in perpetuity so the, the, there's 8,000 square meters of permanently affordable creative workspace protected inside the Hackneywick Central Master Plan area. Um, some of that has just been purchased by the Creative Land Trust, the London Wide Creative Land Trust. Uh, so their first acquisition is Stone Studios, which is a Telford Homes development in Hackneywick, which is very exciting and I think uh, shows 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 what can be done if you if you think far enough ahead. And the interesting thing is that outside the red line of the the Hackneywick Central Master Plan area it has a knock-on effect on rents and we've now got the collective who are outside the red line who are making a commitment to eight pounds a square foot to end user on their ground floor which is amazing and I think that really does give opportunities for creative businesses startups enterprises that potentially aren't as profitable as others to get a good start in their life as a community organization so really excited to see how that goes and uh, I think when in Hackney we're going to try and be difficult as usual and, and, and build a, a circular high street and see how that works. Great answers. Thank you so much, all three of you. I, I mean, obviously, we work with a lot of community land trusts in housing, so really interested in to see how uh, uh, the test bed of these kind of affordable housing models and as you're describing, William, affordable um, commercial models, they really they, they may seem like a struggle but they actually sort of set an agenda. People can then um, set point to Hackney Wick and, and look at all your successes and really start to kind of define other um, areas across the country. Very inspired by what you said. I think it's a world first. I think yeah. we'll have to check, but I think the world first for commercial space to be put into trust. So glad we ought to catch up. After. Yeah, great. Well, we're running out of time, but I think I've just got one more question. And the reason I'm gonna answer it, ask it is because I don't really know I don't understand the question. So I, I want to know if anyone else does. If we don't, we'll just hold our hands up and say we don't know. And I'm sorry, I don't know the answer. Lucy Bullivant, Bullivant even asked the question, what do the panels think about the Preston model of community wealth building? Okay, William knows, phew, as a viable um, hyper local model. And do they see it more widely applicable in other UK towns affected by negative socioeconomic factors? Are you nodding, William? Yes, I am. Uh, Preston, I'm a big fan of Preston. Um, Can you tell fact, us what, what's interesting about the community wealth building? For those who don't know, I'm embarrassed to say. I, I think, uh, we're, luckily, we had uh, John Newbig in, who's, um, some of you may know, he works, uh, he's an advisor to the Mayor of London on culture and creativity. Uh, and he gave a masterclass yesterday and, and mentioned Preston and talked <laughs> about how their target was of sourcing 15% of um, goods and services within their own neighborhood and I think mm, okay. um, the impact of that has been absolutely incredible on the local economy and also relationships I mean the personal relationships that you build locally by sourcing your local supply chain can't be underestimated as well 
I think personal relationships at the end of the day, the hyper local personal relationship network is is absolutely essential. I'm so glad one of you went to that talk yesterday. Did anyone else have anything to add to that answer? No, I think um, I've lost the Q&A one second. Let me find it again. I wonder if any of you have got questions for each other before we wrap up. Or maybe you're answering it as you go. I think um, Kyle, my co-director, I'll ask his question. You know, we work together all day. I could be kind. Um, both Christina and Will describe big business institutions capturing the inherent value of the high streets in creative enterprise zones, values which have, have often been created by local communities and business. And I think um, we've touched on that a little bit, but do they think that big businesses and local enterprise can share the high street in the long term or does one inevitably displace the other? Um, shall I, I, go, I, I, I hope that they can share. I yeah. think we've, got a, we've got an example. We've got Savills uh, in Hackneywick. They've, um, uh, they bought the Corals Estate Agency and, and now Savills, obviously a massive organization are, are on the high street effectively um they're our local estate agent and they're, they're they're they have a very good so far a very good history of engaging with the local community supporting the local community i'm very pleased that they've just bought four copies of the back cover of the wick newspaper so mm -hmm. so uh, they're sort of making our business model sustainable uh and i think those are sort of you know there's a quid pro quo I think it's relatively easy in Hackneywick to say to the, the, the development sector, if you're going to use art and culture to sell your houses and flats, then you have to be seen to invest in it. And I think, mm -hmm. I think corporate social responsibility and um, I, don't, I can't remember the three letter acronym that has sort of replaced CSR, but it's e economic ESG, is it? Um, ESG that is a, is a new sort of city buzzword and it's it's sort of taking over uh, and looking at these values hopefully we can persuade big business to, to, to engage at a grassroots level they see the value in that. Thanks William. I, I think they can share myself um, but I think the big challenges are in um, I think they sort of uh, need to learn from each other so I think that local businesses have to use the tools that more generic businesses use like the online tools mm -hmm. that's that the they they have something that the big businesses don't which is a automatic appeal for people like um me <laughs> that want to have um a, a, a kind of a, a lower impact a car lower carbon impact so, mm -hmm. so there, there is a kind of um a capital on um on local uh, independent businesses and that needs to be recognized and in fact um you know uh, big businesses are now trying to disguise themselves as independent mm. uh, because they know that there is a retail value for that mm. but i think you know what i'd really love to see and this is a sort of um, a kind of um uh, a wish for the future i want to see more street markets i want to mm. see, um uh, more um, uh, more uh, markets at schools. I want to see um, um, our kind of local uh, resources do more to connect people and individuals and um, to sort of to trade. And that can be both done online, that can be done in school playgrounds. Um, there are things like teenage markets um, mm -hmm. that could really encourage entrepreneurship and innovation. And I think, um, I think that kind of... Uh, um, Agility comes from uh, grassroots, and and businesses, uh, big and uh, businesses, kind of uh, take. They are much harder to move. They take a, a while to adjust, and we we just uh, as as hyper local communities, we, mm. we we are much more resilient and much more able to to um, to um, to innovate. Thank you, Christina. Well. I'm going to wrap up. We have a few minutes over, but we started a few minutes late. I got the thumbs up from um, Rowena at the London Society to <laughs> go in a few minutes, but I will wrap up now. I, uh, I feel like we could carry on talking for a while and we're getting into some really good detail. Always the conversation turns to value, the value, the monetary value and the social value. And I think, Christina, you kind of touched on something that perhaps is a talk for another time, but we, it's really about the public realm that connects to the kind of busyness of high streets. I think, you know, we, we touched on the idea that high streets, they're places to linger and spend time, but they are also places to be with your 
neighbors. They are places to spend time with your neighbors in your community. So it's not just about that they're full and busy for shops and economic reasons, but they're actually places where society exists. So um, that's what's so vital. And I think what William showed us is that we need to get in early. We need to really capture the value and the quality of what's existing. And I think uh, both William and Vlad um, have talked about the kind of need to be quite radical in the structures that we approach. The high street trust is sort of quite a radical idea, but it's so obvious when you've described it so well. Um, and ultimately, the point of this is that we retain the kind of complexity and the quality of life that local neighbourhoods can bring us. Um, and, you know, the Preston model, I'm now going to read the Guardian article that Lucy mentioned, it, all, it sounds really fascinating in terms of um, sourcing and valuing those the local relationships that can deliver that. So I'm going to say thank you so much to Three Speakers and London Society and all of the attendees. It's been really interesting. So thank you so much.